All right, let's talk about something we all take for granted. I'm talking about the stuff that holds our world together, quite literally. It's in the car you drive, the skyscraper you work in, the fork you eat with, and even the tiny springs in the phone you're probably holding right now. It's steel. We see it, we touch it, we use it every single day, but most of us have no earthly idea where it comes from. We just know it's strong, it's reliable, and it's everywhere. It's the unsung hero of our modern lives, the silent partner in progress, and the backbone of just about everything we build. The story of steel isn't a clean one. It's not made in a sterile lab by people in white coats. It's forged in fire and fury, in places that are loud, hot, and frankly a little bit terrifying. I've been to some of these places and let me tell you, it's a humbling experience, it's a dirty job, a dangerous job, and it's done by hardworking people who deserve a ton of respect. They take humble rocks from the ground and, through a process that feels like something out of a fantasy novel, they transform them into the very skeleton of our civilization. It's a symphony of chemistry, engineering, and sheer brute force. So how does it happen? How do we go from a pile of reddish-brown dirt to a gleaming steel beam that can support a bridge? It's a journey, and it's a fascinating one. It involves giant ovens, molten rivers of metal, and a recipe more precise than your grandma's prize-winning cake. We're going to pull back the curtain on this whole operation. Everything has to start somewhere and for steel, that somewhere is deep inside the earth. The main ingredient, the star of the show, is iron ore. This isn't some shiny metallic rock you'd pick up and admire. Most of the time it just looks like reddish brown dirt or rusty looking rocks. It's basically a rock that's packed with iron oxides. To get it, massive machines, some of them the size of a small building, claw and tear at the earth in enormous open pit mines. It's a dusty, dirty business that literally moves mountains to get at the good stuff. These rocks are the foundation of everything, the very first step in a long and fiery journey. But iron ore can't do the job alone. It needs a couple of key partners to make the magic happen. The first is coal. Not just any coal, a special type called coking coal. This coal is baked in an oven without any air, a process that burns off all the impurities and leaves behind almost pure carbon. The result is a hard, porous, silvery-gray material called coke. Why go to all this trouble? Because coke does two critical things in the steel-making process. It provides the intense heat needed to melt everything down and it acts as a chemical agent that helps separate the iron from the rock. The final ingredient in our primordial soup is limestone. Again, we're talking about a rock that's quarried out of the ground. You've probably seen it used in buildings or landscaping. In the steel-making process, limestone plays the role of a cleaner. Now that we've gathered our ingredients, it's time to cook. And the kitchen for this particular recipe is a monstrous, fire-breathing beast called a blast furnace. Forget your backyard grill, we're talking about a steel-plated tower. It can be over 100 feet tall, lined on the inside with special heat-resistant bricks. This thing runs 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, sometimes for years at a time without stopping. Shutting one down and starting it back up is a massive, expensive undertaking. It's a relentless, perpetually hungry giant. Our job is to keep it fed. The feeding process is a carefully choreographed dance. A conveyor belt system called a skip hoist carries our raw materials to the very top of the furnace. From there they are dumped inside in alternating layers. Iron ore, coke, limestone. It's like making a giant industrial lasagna. Massive pipes called tuyeres blast superheated air into the base of the furnace, sometimes over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where the term blast furnace comes from. This continuous powerful blast ignites the coke, turning the bottom into a raging inferno. The heat creates a column of searing hot gas that rises up through the layers. The whole structure is a marvel of engineering, designed to contain and control an immensely powerful chemical reaction. This is where the transformation begins, solid rock starting its journey toward a liquid river of metal. The beast has been fed, and now it's going to work. Inside that roaring blast furnace, a whole lot of chemistry is happening. Ore, coke, limestone slowly descend, they begin to transform. The blast of hot air ignites the coke, creating carbon monoxide gas. This gas is the real workhorse here, rising up through the furnace and reacting with iron ore, chemically stripping the oxygen atoms away from the iron atoms, like a chemical divorce where carbon monoxide woos the oxygen away. This process, known as reduction, reduces iron oxide back to iron. As the materials sink, temperatures climb past 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. The freed iron atoms liquefy, trickling down as a slow, oozing rain into the hearth. Limestone breaks down, combines with silica, alumina, other rocky impurities to form molten slag. 
This forms a molten, lightweight substance called slag. Because the slag is lighter than the molten iron, it floats on top of the pool of metal at the bottom of the hearth. This is a brilliant bit of natural separation, like oil floating on water. You end up with two distinct liquid layers, the valuable molten iron on the bottom and the waste slag on top. Every few hours, it's time to tap the furnace. This is a process that looks like something out of a medieval dragon story. Workers use a powerful drill to punch a hole, called a tap hole, into the side of the furnace. First, they tap a higher hole to drain off the floating layer of slag which flows out like volcanic lava into special rail cars. It's later cooled and can be used for things like road construction, making cement. Then, a lower tap hole is opened, and out comes the prize. A glowing, white-hot river of pure molten iron. This liquid iron often called pig iron is the primary product of the blast furnace and the first major step towards making steel. The river of molten metal that flows from the blast furnace is not yet steel. It's what's known as pig iron or sometimes just hot metal. While it's about 95% pure iron that remaining 5% is a big problem. It's loaded with a high concentration of carbon picked up from the coke in the blast furnace along with other leftover impurities like sulfur, phosphorus, and silicon. This high carbon content makes the iron very brittle. You could probably shatter a chunk of it with a good swing from a sledgehammer. To turn this brittle iron into strong, versatile steel, we have to get rid of that excess carbon and the other junk. This is where the next stage of the process begins, in a vessel that's just as impressive as the blast furnace. The two most common methods are the basic oxygen furnace, or BOF, and the electric arc furnace, or EAF. In the BOF process, the molten pig iron is poured into a massive pear-shaped converter. Then, a long water-cooled lance is lowered from the top, and it blasts pure oxygen onto the surface of the molten metal at supersonic speeds. This creates a violent, incredibly hot reaction. The oxygen combines with the excess carbon, creating carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide gas, which then escapes from the furnace. The reaction inside the basic oxygen furnace is intense and fast. It's a churning, boiling, roaring cauldron of liquid metal. Once the excess carbon and impurities have been burned off, what we have is a bath of relatively pure molten steel. But the job isn't done yet. This is where the real cooking, the true alchemy of steelmaking, comes into play. Think of this pure molten steel as a blank canvas or a base dough. By itself it's useful but its true potential is unlocked by adding very specific ingredients. This stage is often called secondary steelmaking or ladle metallurgy. It's all about fine-tuning the chemistry to create a specific type of steel for a specific job. The molten steel is tapped from the BOF and from the EAF into a massive ceramic-lined ladle. Steelmakers, part metallurgist, part master chef, get to work. They take a sample and analyze its chemical composition in a lab, a process that takes only a few minutes. Based on the results, they know exactly what to add to hit the target specs. It's a highly scientific process that demands incredible precision. This is where alloying comes in. An alloy is a metal made by combining two or more metallic elements. Stainless steel for a kitchen sink, add chromium, add nickel, hard steel for a drill bit, add tungsten, add vanadium, structural steel for buildings, add manganese, adjust carbon content. Each element imparts different properties. Manganese increases hardness and strength. Nickel improves toughness, especially at low temperatures. Chromium boosts hardness and resistance to rust. Molybdenum helps the steel maintain its strength at high temperatures. The additions are carefully measured and stirred, often by bubbling argon through the ladle from the bottom. That creates a homogeneous batch with the exact chemical recipe required. We've cooked up the perfect batch of custom-made molten steel. It has the exact chemical composition we need, but right now, it's just a giant glowing puddle of liquid. To make it useful, we have to turn it into a solid shape, this is the final major transformation called continuous casting, a marvel of efficiency, turning liquid steel directly into a solid semi-finished shape slab, billet, bloom, all in one uninterrupted process. A ladle full of molten steel is lifted by a massive overhead crane and positioned over the casting machine. The steel is poured into a holding tank called a tundish, which acts as a reservoir and helps control the flow. From the tundish, the steel flows down into a water-cooled copper mold. As the outer layer touches the cold mold, it instantly solidifies into a thin shell. That shell contains the still molten core as it's slowly drawn down out of the bottom of the mold. The long strand, solid skin, liquid center is pulled out and sprayed with a massive amount of cool water. 
This forces solidification from the outside in. The strand rides a long series of rollers along a gentle curve, transitioning from vertical to horizontal. By the end of this roller coaster like path, the strand is completely solid. It's still glowing red hot, but now a continuous, solid piece of metal. At the end of the casting line, powerful torches cut the moving strand into lengths. Depending on the mold shape, pieces can be thick rectangular slabs, plates or coils, long square billets, bars or wires, thick squarish blooms, structural shapes like I-beams. These semi-finished shapes are either sent to a holding area to cool or sent directly to the next hot shaping stage, saving energy. The slabs, billets and blooms that come off the caster are the raw forms of solid steel, but they're not yet the products we use every day. They need one more step of shaping to get them into their final form. The most common method for this is hot rolling. The still glowing hot piece of steel is passed through a series of massive, powerful rollers. Each set of rollers squeezes the steel making it thinner, making it longer, and shaping it more precisely. Imagine running a piece of dough through a pasta maker to get it thinner and thinner. It's the same basic principle but on a colossal fiery scale. For thin sheets for car bodies, thick slabs are passed back and forth through rollers until they become a long thin sheet which is then coiled up at the end of the line. For I-beams, a bloom is passed through specially shaped rollers that squeeze it into that I-cross section. The same rolling process makes railroad tracks, rebar for reinforcing concrete, and round bars used later for tools and machine parts. This rolling not only shapes the steel, it refines the internal grain structure, making it stronger and tougher. While rolling is common, it's not the only way to shape steel. Forging is another method. Steel is heated, then hammered or pressed into shape. It's the industrial version of a blacksmith with a hammer and anvil. Forging makes extremely strong parts like crankshafts for engines, high-pressure valves, and heavy-duty tools. The intense pressure of forging aligns the grain structure, making the steel resistant to impact and fatigue. Once rolled, forged, or otherwise formed, the steel might go through finishing processes. It could be heat-treated again, coated with zinc, galvanizing, or painted. After all these steps, the steel is finally ready. It's shipped out from the mill to factories and construction sites. The steel that began as a rock is now a car door, a bridge girder, a surgical scalpel, a paperclip. Its long, fiery journey is complete, and its useful life is just beginning. So, there you have it. From a rusty rock dug out of the ground to a fiery bath in a blast furnace to a precise chemical recipe in a ladle, finally through a series of massive rollers, the journey of steel is nothing short of epic. It's a story of transformation on a scale that's hard to comprehend. It takes mountains of raw materials, incredible amounts of energy, the tireless work of thousands of dedicated people. It's a dirty, dangerous and demanding job, but the result is the very material that underpins our entire modern society. Next time you get in your car, walk into an office building, or cook a meal on your stove, take a second to think about the steel that makes it all possible. Think about the colossal blast furnace, the roaring oxygen converter, the glowing red river of metal being squeezed into shape. The strength we take for granted in a bridge isn't magic. It was meticulously crafted in a mill. The shine on a stainless steel fork isn't just for looks. It's the result of adding chromium to a ladle of liquid fire. Every piece of steel has a story of heat, pressure, and incredible power. This process, refined over more than a century, is a testament to human ingenuity. We learn to take iron ore and purify and perfect it into versatile steel. We tailor its properties like a master chef, thousands of types for tens of thousands of applications. From delicate watch springs to the massive hull of an aircraft carrier, steel does it all. The world today would be impossible without it. No towering skyscrapers, no long-span bridges, no reliable cars, no safe, efficient way to transport food, water, energy. Steel is the silent, strong backbone that supports our way of life. It's easy to overlook because it's everywhere, 